And good evening to those of you on Facebook Live as we prepare to go live on the SVP TV network. Write the title down and bring it to me. Down. Okay. You know what I forgot? Tonight show, you, if you see me sitting at this desk and not at my normal on the normal set, you know that I have a guest. I probably did more guests in the last month than I've done probably in the last year. But tonight is the truth about black folk in politics and business in the city of Memphis. And I do have a guest, one of the greatest uh, legal minds around, uh, attorney Ricky Wilkins. This show is probably going to end up being controversial because Ricky is probably as blunt as I am. So those of you that's coming in on Facebook, you may want to tag somebody right now and let them know what we're going to deal with. I should be back on my regular Facebook page Friday, hopefully. And we'll see how long we can last this time. The truth about Memphis politics and business dealing with black folk. Uh, Shante Hughes, good evening to you. Thank you, Shante. Monica Jackson, Mob Tight, Daphne Davis, Maria Truesdale, Claudia Smith, Toshiba Green, Iris Buckley, Lisa Kimball, Tobias Green. So we'll be going live in just a moment. I'm going to also be telling you about a black business owner that was arrested over the weekend. I think maybe on Thursday, Friday, though. Uh, what's this date on here? The 3rd of November for choking <laughs> one of his customers. Just came from around the corner and choked him. In fact, in the affidavit of complaint, he even states that he, he did it. Hmm. So we'll be telling you about that also tonight. Uh, but a lot of things, Ricky Wilkins, um, well, I'll just wait till Ricky gets on the set. But Ricky ran against Steve Cohen a few years ago, 2014, and came as close as any Democratic uh, candidate has come. Because we've had a bunch of Folks that were not prepared to run a race, uh, and that's probably what we'll get this time. Individuals who are not prepared to run uh, for that particular seat. But Ricky is very concerned about blacks and businesses. SVP team. Well, no. that means I'm going to do my thing. No, Jerry, it ain't safe. The views and opinions expressed on this talk show are those of the talk show hosts, the producers, and or persons appearing on the program, and do not <coughs> reflect the views and opinions of the SVP network. This program- Baby, tiptoe man, did that work for you, man? Just put yes or no on page. Advised. <laughs> Take that gun. 
judge when you thought it was safe. It is absolutely positively not. And good Monday evening to you. I am the one and only. I'm Daddy is Matthews. And welcome again to still the most controversial, the hardest hitting, the most provocative, the rawest, non filtered, not giving a damn what you think talk show anywhere on the planet. And I promise you tonight that it's going to be controversial. Anytime you see this desk in front of me and I'm not on my regular set, that means that I have a guest in the house. I have one of the greatest legal minds in this area on this set and on this show on tonight. Uh, Attorney Ricky Wilkins. And we're going to be talking about tonight the truth about black folks in politics and in business. There is sure to come up some very controversial issues and some things that you've heard me talk about on this show. Ricky's concern is blacks in business, but he's had his hands in politics uh, as well. You, you, y'all remember, he's the attorney that I told you about that uh, Myron Laurie fired because Ricky had uncovered the dirt on Beale Street and being the token Negro that Myron Laurie was, that he fired Ricky so that the investigation as to the millions of dollars that was missing off of Beale Street would just be squashed. So we may get into that. Ricky Wilkins is also uh, the candidate that ran against uh, Steve Coins in 2014 and came the closest Democrat to ever almost unseat Steve Coins. So there's a lot of things that's going to be discussed on tonight. Tomorrow night show, I'm going to deal with you and the because you want to be. You don't want to work. That's, that's the reason that many of you uh, who are on your EBTs or you're just lazy and trifling, you don't have a job. You just don't want no job. And this comes about, we had a job fair and we had, not to turn out that I expected, but we had a nice turnout and those that wanted a job got employed on Saturday. But many of you say you want a job, hey, you don't want no job. Your ass just lazy. You, you trifling. You, you waiting for the white man to give you something. And, I, and I, I, can I share something with you? White man ain't supposed to give you nothing. Okay, you, you, no, he ain't supposed to give you nothing. Just get up off your ass and go and get whatever it is that you're supposed to get or what you want to get. We'll deal with that on tomorrow night. Look, let me tell you about black business that y'all better be careful at. And if you don't like his product, he'll choke you. I, I swear, I got the I got the affidavit of complaint right here in my hand. He got arrested. And he did. If you crump his hot wings, mm-hmm. crump his. Y'all go and eat crump his hot wings. I know, I, I know, crump got mad at me a few years ago. He did, and issued a restraining order against me that I violated because one thing I knew, see, I had a good lawyer. Yeah, Jay Belly was, he's not one of these Negro lawyers in this city that's, that's fearful. See, you got some of these Negro lawyers in this city that's scared to take on the controversial subjects. They want to stay in the safe zone. He, Carmen tried to sue me, Dale. Please ask me why he tried to sue me and try to get a restraining order for me. Please ask me why. Why probably sue you, Because Crumpet's wife was on a videotape sucking a man's white mother. It was on Facebook. It had went all around the city. So when I, you saw it too? Okay. So when I talked about it, on, I was on the radio there. When I talked about it, he got mad at me 
and sent me a restraining order. Now, you know I violated the restraining order because you cannot restrain prior speech. I hadn't said it yet. So it's illegal. You, am I right, Rick? Okay. You cannot restrain prior speech. You can't sue me for something I may say. Okay. So, so y'all do know I went all out after that. When, when I got the restraining order, I went all out and I talked about uh, his wife. It was his wife. Don't get mad at me. He was supposed to get mad at his wife. His wife was on the video. The man that who's wearing the thing she was sucking on took the video of it and he put, he, I guess she got mad or something. And it was just everybody. So when I talk about it, you get mad. I don't know whether Crumpets got mad because the man's wang my thing was bigger than his or what. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I didn't care. But here it is now. The other night, let, let me just read. On the third day of November 2017, in said county and within the jurisdiction of the criminal court of Shelby County, uh, one Donald Crump did unlawfully commit the offense of aggravated assault. TCA, that's Tennessee Code Annotated, 39-13-102. Further, applicant makes oath that the, I gotta read it, essential facts constituting said offenses are as follows. Lieutenant Hawkins, uh, 505C, was flagged down regarding an assault occurring at 671 South Highland Street, Crumpets Hot Wings. Renisha Moore stated that she was strangled by Defender Donald Crump. I almost said Donald Trump. <laughs> I did almost say Donald Trump, but he's Donald Crump. Okay. The victim got into a verbal altercation with the defendant about her food being cold. The defendant walked from behind the counter and put his hands around her neck and began strangling her. Four witnesses stated they observed the victim throw her food on the floor and the defendant coming around from uh, the counter putting his hands around her neck. Investigators met with the defendant who stated that he did put his hand around the victim's neck. You confess on the scene to strangling somebody. But he was released on a $2,000 bond. But now you're going to get a lawsuit. If Renisha, her mother called me this morning. If they smart, y'all gonna go get y'all a good lawyer and some crumpets. Y'all can have hot wings forever. He got five or six locations around the city. This is a black man in business. You, that's the reason they call them hot wings because you don't want cold wings. Okay, you don't want no cold wings. You want, what's the key word? Hot wings. So if you're ordering some hot wings, you don't expect it because the lady said, my chicken cold, my french fries is cold. Don't nobody want no cold chicken and no cold french fries, okay? So, I don't want it. And she threw it on the floor. And he come around, because he was going to serve that chicken to somebody else. So, so she comes around and, oh, you going to eat my chicken. You going to eat my chicken. My french fries and I, I don't let it sit out there half a day being in the, you going to eat it, you going to eat it. He was arrested and taken to jail for what's this aggravated, and this is a felony, aggravated assault. So y'all have to decide whether y'all want to patronize a business that's choking its customers. Make me that chicken. This chicken good. Probably was in honey gold. This, and use all this sauce on this chicken and you gonna throw it on the floor. You gonna eat this chicken. I, I bet as he was choking on, he was trying to reach down 
and pick the chicken. Huh, you gonna eat? You 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 gonna eat this chicken? But that's Trump explaining. So you have to decide whether you want to patronize this particular uh, business uh, anymore. But black businesses, black businesses, a lot of times. Black businesses have to understand that if you want black folk to patronize you, you got to do business in the right way. You got to spend money on your advertising and your marketing. Okay, uh, it's it's just a fact. You know, it's it's just a fact. I, I I got a young man I tried to help because I, I tasted his product. And I'm talking about Papa Bell wings, skins. I, I got I got wings on my mind. And, oh, give me some tonight too. Papa Bell skins. Everybody know my commercials do not go for no five hundred dollars. But I saw the young man, and I said, Look, let me help this this bro. I tasted the the skins, and they were good. They're still good. He advertised. I gave him a five hundred dollar price and eight skins for two weeks every night on TV. Good product. Got him in a store with his product. He was not in a store. He was selling out the back seat of his car. Got him in a store. Talking about him on TV. Y'all calling and picking up. That's, that's fine. And I hope the young man success. But as I shared with the young man a few minutes ago who had been dodging my calls for the last three days because he owed me some money, then don't dodge me, brother. If you ain't got no money, tell me. Just tell me you ain't got no money. And let's see if we can work something out. But don't dodge me. And like I told you, I, I can't advertise you if you have not paid me. Okay? This is a business. If you don't pay me, then I can't advertise you will not advertise you. I don't care how black you are. See, black folk will spend their money with white folk. Y'all take your money to white folk and y'all be on time paying the white folk. And I'm talking about people that advertise and do their marketing. Y'all, you take your money to white folk. And I'm talking about these politicians too. You take your money to advertise. One thing I can say about Ricky, when he ran for Congress, Ricky paid me well. Okay? Didn't, didn't have to worry about his check, didn't have to worry about nothing. Ricky paid me. But some of you other politicians, you run for office and think that the black media, black owned media, which is only my show, the SVP TV network, uh, WLOK radio, and the new tri state defender, that's the only black owned media that you have in this town. But black folk mistreat black folk. Folk in business. And yes, black folk that's in business, you got to treat folk right. So I know, uh, Brother Kevin, all the success in the world, but I can't advertise you for free, brother. And now that you've broken our agreement, when you come back, you got to pay regular price. Because I gave you a special rate, $500 a month. And you just sell it. And see, the mistake we make is not understanding that there are other businesses that's doing the same thing as you that keep their flow and keep their flow of revenue coming in because they let the community know where they are. All right, Ricky Wilkins is my guest. Thank you so much for those of you who were at the Naked Truth Liberation and Empowerment Ministries on yesterday. Had a great time as the message was, Excuses, excuses, excuses. Thanks to those of you who came out on Saturday to the job fair we had at the church. Uh, thanks to uh, Tiptoe and his lovely, what you call the Queen of Peace. Queen of Love and Peace came out. They brought some uh, blankets. And, and again, one of the things that we're trying to do is outreach. There are plenty of people of all nationalities in this community that when the winter time comes and the cold weather comes, 
that sleep outdoors, sleeping in parks, sleeping on benches, sleeping under trees, sleeping on the ground, sleeping under bridges. And what we want to do at Naked Truth Liberation and Empowerment Ministries is I want to get a hundred blankets, a hundred blankets, even if you get some blankets at the house that you put up and they're nice blankets. I don't want none that's tattered that you wouldn't sleep on them. But I've got people buying brand new uh, spreads and sh things of that nature. Right, we, we, we got them, they're buying them. They're buying them brand new blankets. They're buying brand new blankets. Even got Brother Lavelle McCray all the way from Oakland, California, sent two blankets to the church the other day. This is something that I want to do, just bring it to um, the church, 3835 Raleigh Militant Road, drop them off there. And uh, we'll, when we get 100, I'm going to be going throughout those areas, making sure individuals get blankets. There are children, I want you to know that there are children also that are with their mothers most of the time, mothers who are sleeping outdoors, sleeping under violence and things of that nature. And we want to be there to assist them as well. All right, uh, y'all need to put the clock on and change, change the time too, because I thought I was almost through for the night. <laughs> Let's, y'all change the clock back, because I, I thought I had talked about all my time just about. And then when he changed, when he moves that, well, you gonna, I'm gonna go to commercial break. Well, yeah, I'm gonna go to break. Cause I wanna get Ricky Wilkins on here. There's so much that I want to talk with Ricky about. And he has a new program called Mem Power. Okay, what is Mem Power all about? Ricky's been through quite a bit this year. But if anybody know God is good, Ricky Wilkins know about the goodness of God. I know your mama and your grandmama watching, ain't it? Huh? Y'all can still come see me. I know I ain't in Westwood no more, but y'all y'all can still come see me. Drive on out there one Sunday morning and be with me. Ricky has been through quite a bit, and I'm going to let him tell you about it when we come back. And then we're going to get just raw off into uh, some things that is happening, what he wants to do. And I want him to know that Naked Truth stands available. Any meetings that he needs to have in the North Memphis area concerning this particular project, uh, the doors of the church is open. We're going to take a commercial message and then when we come back on the set with me will be attorney Ricky Wilkins. We'll be back right after this. All right, let's set him up. <laughs> Uh, I might be moved down a bit in the in the oh yeah in front of me. So down, I can't get it. I can't get it to come up. See if he can hear you. They were not on the main page. Testing one, two. Testing one, two. Gotcha. 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 Gotc
Baby Ray, are you telling me no? Did you you got him let us you check him? He was he was fine. Yeah. Okay. Just walk the truth. You can get everything you need to look good, whether it's on Sunday morning or after hours. Ferguson, chapter nine, you can heal at Clint Chapter. Big Ray, I'm not on my main page. Samuel King Old Maze is on the page. At least I get him somewhere. I can't get him to come to church. <laughs> we can take your name off the rolls, Sam. You and Janita gone. Uh, who the hell? Who is this calling me and I'm working? Sir, I'm on the air. What the hell are you calling me for? You see me on the air. Get your damn ass off the phone and you see me working. Damn. Can we trade them all under the name? Let's roll. Let's roll. When you look at yourself, you know, ask me a question you don't want to know the truth to. All right. <laughs> Okay. And uh, it's been a long, uh, it's 
January, this is November, so it's almost almost a year mm -hmm. uh, that I've been dealing with this, but, but God sustains and provides and mm -hmm. keeps me going. So I'm here tonight to talk to you about our community and the things that concern me about where we are and where we must go. And uh, my health is just, uh, I tell people it's like, a, for, for me, it's like a walk in a park uh, or climbing a hill. Right? Okay. okay. And it's just one more hill. I've been climbing hills my whole life. So this is no nothing different. It's just a different type of hill. But it's a hill that I'll climb. Mem power. What is mem power all about? Mem power is about two things. Uh, economic and political empowerment mm -hmm. for the African American community. Very simple. Mm -hmm. Economic and political empowerment for the African American community. Those two things are foundational and critical to everything that needs to happen to be talked about relative to improving black folks' position in this community and lifting black folks up where they belong. You can't get there mm -hmm. without economic empowerment and political empowerment. So when we started to talk to Ricky about economic empowerment, do we have any? Well, we, we have the potential for tremendous mm -hmm. economic empowerment. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about that tonight. Mm -hmm. We'll jump right in because I, I tell people that with this cancer that I have, I don't have time to miss words anymore. Okay. I don't have time to dance around issues anymore. I got to talk plain and straight to the issue mm -hmm. so that we can be on and be about the business of getting to the heart of the matter. Mm -hmm. In the city of Memphis, today and every day, white people spend 99% of their money with themselves. Okay. They don't spend any money of any note with black folks. Okay. So they take home about 99% of their money back to their communities. On the flip side of that, black folks spend upwards of 90% of their money with white folks. Mm -hmm. So when white folks take home 99% of their money and 90 plus percent of our money, there ain't a whole lot of money left for black folks. But but we both know that there is income and there is money in the black community. And I've talked about it many times on this program. Why is it that we have a hatred to do business with each other? Now, and let me say this, sure, there's some bad black businesses out there, but then there's some bad white businesses that you will continue to go through and go to rather, no matter how bad they treat you. Uh, there are foreigners who come into this country, put stores in our community, and they can talk bad and down to black women, but you continue to go there. So where does the hatred start for us in doing business with us? Well, you know that uh, that issue is historical and it has been around generationally. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that African Americans will support other businesses, regardless of uh, what kind of treatment they may receive or mm -hmm. what kind of inferior service they may receive, but yet they continue to support, if not that same business, mm -hmm. one very similar to it. Mm -hmm. And yet with African Americans, I ask the question, why do we give up on ourselves so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we give up on ourselves after one incident but yet we will continue to support other businesses regardless of the outcome of our patronage of those businesses. One of the things that we want to talk about in Empower is to say to black folks, we must start spending our money with folks who spend their money with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right now, white people, and nor have they historically, spent their money with the black community. Why would you continue to support anybody that support you. So what do you say, Ricky, to the to the notion that black folks say, well, uh, I got to go to the black community. We don't have no grocery stores in our community. So I need to go grocery shopping. Uh, we don't really have any black new car dealerships in our community. Uh, so what do I do? do when I need certain products and we don't have them in the black community. Well, I'm not one that's, that's uh, unrealistic. There will be times when 
the cause of the absence or the unavailability mm -hmm. of certain products or goods that are needed, one may have to go in a certain direction in order okay. to satisfy that, that, that need. Mm -hmm. But I want to speak to a consciousness that says to our folks, let black businesses be my first thought. Mm -hmm. not my third or fourth or last. Mm -hmm. Let it be my first thought. Let me explore and exhaust whether or not there's a black business that can satisfy my need okay. before I go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying to someone who may need, in your example, uh, may, may desire, if you will, a brand new car or something. Okay. Okay. And there's not a black business that can provide okay. that to me here. Now, I will say in this internet age, there are black, uh, there are black businesses that have cars in other other communities. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea is is to continue is to support those entities that are most likely to hire your son. Okay. To hire your daughter. So I okay. want to make this personal based on some of the stuff that I read that when I ran for Congress. When we start talking about political empowerment, we want to talk about how do we position ourselves to put people in place that are more likely to hire your son mm -hmm. or hire your daughter. We want to talk about putting people in place who make you their number one priority, not their third or fourth or fifth priority, number one. Black folks are the majority in this community. They're the least supported by the total community. They're the most in pain. They're the most in jeopardy. They deserve to be the number one priority of every politician in the city. What's it not saying? Number one priority. What's it not here? Here, here we go, Rick. Here we go. We got a majority city council. We got a majority black county commission. We do. But look at the numbers of blacks that don't get business. And I'm talking about qualified. I'm, I'm not talking about the businesses that are not qualified. But you get your qualified businesses to go in with a contract. And your black majority of the city council, your black majority county commission does not make it possible for blacks to do business. We know that in us alone, mm -hmm. there is a percentage of business that the city of Atlanta must do with black businesses. We don't have that in place in Memphis, but we got black politicians. We got blacks that say, vote for me, I'll set you free. Every four years they come and tell us the same lie. And we put them right back in, and they haven't fulfilled the promises of the other two terms that they've already had. So when we start talking about economics in the city, and we start talking about blacks being the majority in the city and the county now, how do we make the black leadership that wants our vote stand up for us and create the economic base? Well, let me, let me address that issue head on. And I want to make this very, very clear to, you, mm -hmm. to your listening audience. There are many African-American elected officials who represent and truly do want to improve the community to the, to the best of their ability. But Ooh. let's be clear. Who? Let's okay. be clear. Let's be clear. As long as, and this is the point I want everybody to remember, as long as African-American elected officials have to go to the same white businessmen that control the city and have historically the ability and the extent to which they can move the needle is limited from day one. Well, because African American community, we don't support, we don't elect our leaders, we don't put the money, our money where our mouth is. When I ran for Congress, I put up my own money. Mm -hmm. Because I knew asking African Americans for their money, especially in that race, I'd just be whistling in the wind. Mm -hmm. We have to be serious about putting skin in the game, putting most of the money to support these candidates coming from our community, now they're beholden to us and not beholden to the same rich white men, primarily white men, mm -hmm. that they run to for every fundraiser for every election. You, you, I'm sure you remember the statement that Willie Harrington made some years ago. You can never be free as long as you take the white man's money. You remember that statement? True then, true now. Okay, so then what you're saying, Ricky, in all honesty is 
that our black politicians don't belong to us? I, 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 yes and no. Um, again, I know that most African American uh, elected officials or people who want to be elected officials, they come from our community. They know the pain of our community. They want to do what's right and good for our community. But, but the reality is, mm -hmm. when they go and have their fundraisers, and there's something going on right now, mm -hmm. when most of their money comes from the white business community, they're beholden to those folks before they get into office. So then we go back to what I just said. They don't belong to us. Okay. okay. The white man has already bought you because if you give me $10,000, break it up however you want to break it up, yeah. with your wife, your children, the dog, and everybody else, so that you meet the guidelines. Okay, if you give me $10,000, but I represent Orange Mound, and I only got $500 out of Orange Mound, when that person who gave me the $500 in Orange Mound calls me, and you're calling me at the same time, guess who's call I'm going to take. I'm going to take yours. Absolutely. Because you've got the capabilities of keeping on with those contributions. Now, but, but doesn't the black politician already know this? When he starts to run, when he decides that he wants to be a candidate, yes, you were in a position to finance your campaign. Okay? But the reason that we're in the situation with a Steve Cohen is because we had 16 folk that was running and 15 of them didn't have the finances to be in the race. They just had a great idea. They just won't run for office. Okay? So our politicians don't belong to us. They belong to wherever they get the money from. Well, and I think that's true generically. In the political discourse, and, 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 and trust me when I say, when I ran for Congress, uh, I put a lot of my own money in the campaign, but I did raise money outside of, mm -hmm. of, of money that I put in. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, Thaddeus, I didn't ask a single businessman in this town, the, the usual suspects, so to speak, for a dime. Mm -hmm. I refused to, because I did not want any of them even thinking that if I won, that they were going to have some uh, access to me that was greater than the people that I was going to Washington to serve. You have to be independent to advance the cause of a poor and disadvantaged community. I knew that. That's why I ran. I didn't run for Ricky Wilkins because I was fine in my law firm representing my clients, serving the community through other ways, like mm -hmm. I'm doing right now through mm -hmm. Mill Power. Mm -hmm. But there has to be a certain amount of independence and autonomy that you have in order to move the needle as far as you can. I'm only simply making the point that in my experience and being close to the political scene, I only, I've only run for office one time. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I'm not running again. Uh, I'm here to do what I think is best uh, for our community based mm -hmm. on my skill sets, based on the time and energy that I have. And right now, it doesn't involve politics, nor will it ever involve politics. As a candidate, mm -hmm. I, will, I will be involved but not as a candidate. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are a lot of young brothers and sisters who are capable. We've got to guide and, 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 and mentor uh, them and prepare them to, 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 to be granted a baton so they can run with it. But, but, but Rick, you see, one of our problems is that the older politician did not set the stage for the young politician. There was no grooming, okay? So, you allow Memphis Simone uh, and those other white control social groups to come and pick up that uninformed Negro young, indoctrinate them into their mindset, and then that's what they turn loose on us. Okay? So the older politicians, the old heads, did the injustice because they want to hang on to a position Forever. I agree with you, and, and that's why, you know, for me, I am analyzing and observing all things at all times. One of the reasons why I'm making it clear to all of the young 
politicians, would-be politicians, that I am not running for office ever again mm -hmm. is because I don't want them seeing me as someone who may be a potential threat to, to their political growth. Mm -hmm. People look at me as that. I've had people call me about running for this, running for that. I'm saying, listen, there are young brothers and sisters who can serve and who will serve well. It doesn't have to be me. I remove Donald Daniel Bradley from the parish. Remove him. Go ahead. That can run and serve this community. We have, as as <clears throat> as as po politicians or public servants, however you describe yourself, there comes a point in time when it is better to hand that baton off to someone else and let them carry it, and you support that initiative from another angle. But when the white man already owns you in office. You can't give up the baton because you like the problems that's failed from the master's table. And then you get those Negroes who run for office who are really the spoilers, okay? And they're not running to win. They don't run to win. They run because you can split the black vote. You can pull uh, votes from a credible candidate, okay? So, I mean, look, let's just call it what it is tonight. Some of these Negroes that we've had elected to office were not for us, never was for us, and the only cause that they answer is from the white power brokers, because well, let's be honest, all the power brokers are white. That ain't racist, that's fact. Ain't none of these Negroes got no power unless they ask permission from the white man that keeps on giving them their contributions. And so that brings me back to men power, because you're right, as it stands right now, uh, there is far too greater influence by the white community mm -hmm. over all affairs mm -hmm. in this community. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw the Real Memphis list that I put out uh, a couple of weeks ago I, on my Facebook page. Okay. You, you gotta see it. It has a list of all of the major political nonprofit entities in town. Okay. It's a list of about 25, mm -hmm. from Chamber of Commerce, MLGW, city mayor, uh, downtown commission, you name it. Mm -hmm. All of them. All PACs? White males okay. or white females. Okay. Not a black, not an African American anywhere. In a city that's majority black. Mm -hmm. I say that black folks have been asleep at the switch to allow that picture to emerge and become a reality that we now have to deal with. I'm in the process of putting the actual budgetary numbers that are associated with those positions because I want to be able to show the African American community and the white community too because I talk to my white friends about this just like I'm talking to you. Mm -hmm. I don't miss words with them mm -hmm. because as you pointed out earlier, the facts are the facts. Mm -hmm. Can't run from them, can't hide from them, let's deal with them. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that you cannot expect Memphis, Tennessee to be a healthy city when it continues to marginalize keep a lid on the progress and production and growth of its largest asset, which is the African-American community. This community was founded on the backs of black folks. And there are some in this community who continue to want to build Memphis up on the backs of black folks. Mm -hmm. It is unhealthy and it is unsustainable. The, the, the conditions that, are, that we deal with every day that we talk about on your show and on mm -hmm. the news shows, all relate back to the absence of a mindset of sharing of resources in the community so that everybody has sufficient resources to survive and thrive. But, but come on, uh, let's, be, let's be honest about something else. Yes. See, there are so many blacks in our community who feel as though the white man's problem is cold. No doubt about that. Okay, no his doubt bread about takes, and, and, and you found it out in running for Congress. No doubt about that. There was no reason for you to lose in 2014 as a congressional candidate against uh, Steve Cohen. He would not debate you, okay? He didn't feel as though. Black folk did not demand that he uh, debate you. He was able to go to the black pastors, give these handkerchief head Negroes a few dollars, and go before their congregations, speak, and they all oh, master Cohen, master Cohen. Okay, black folks did not turn out to vote for you. 
you had an excellent campaign, you had an excellent agenda, but Negroes would not support you. So what do we do to the Negroes? And I'm talking about even leadership, okay? There were blacks in power, okay, that would not come out and support of you because it was going to mess up Master Cohen's agenda. Okay, so what do we do about these Negroes that we have in place that's selling us out? Here's one question that I want your listening audience to ask any politician. Any politician. I've had a couple of gubernatorial candidates come mm -hmm. forward, talk to me about trying to gain entree into the African American community. We have to have leaders who are willing to make the condition of black folks their number one priority. That's the litmus test for me. Are you willing, ma'am, sir, to boldly say that the African American community that's been beat down for generationally in this town, that's last place, every place that matters, in more pain than anybody has ever been in. In need of your attention, are you willing to make them your number one priority? And if you're not, you can't say that. that you, not, you know they can't say that. Listen, that's the test. I want to change the way African American people think. They can't stand up, Ricky. Come on. Well, listen. If you, they can't the stand up. The alternative is is to continue to be where you are. And for some folks that may be acceptable, for me it's not. I want black folks to realize the true extent of their power and their energy. And let me talk for a minute to our church going black folks. We mm -hmm. got a lot of them here. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in the Baptist church. Mm -hmm. We pray to a God that we say want us to live life and live it more abundantly. And I ask you, where is your abundance? Collectively, as a black community, where is your abundance? God has put power in your hands to help manifest that abundance. But you must be willing to stand up and use it. Are you talking about the same black folk that call themselves Christians that serve a God that look like that white man? Is, is, is that the one you're talking about? Is, is, is Jesus on the wall at the church or the baptismal pool is that white man sitting on the rock? So how can he be free even as a Christian or Christian when he's still serving the Jesus that looks like the white man? I told one of your friends, okay? I told one of your friends, Sidney Chisholm. I told Sidney. How you gonna tell me you want me to count him in? How you gonna tell me we need a black in that office when you, Sidney, was handling Jim Strickland? When you was taking the white man in the city, the largest entity of Shelby County, the city of Memphis with the most blacks, how you that had a history of two black males, no matter what we thought of them, especially the last one, no matter what we thought of them, how are you going to tell me now that we need a black male and you was handling the white man, you took the white man to the basketball court with the little black children jumping up, playing basketball, exciting Negroes, and saying to the Negroes, uh, vote for Master Strickland. How are you going to say that now when you run it? See, it's these type of Negroes. Plus, you're 70 something years old. You need to give it to a young man anyway. How are you going to see? It's these type of Negroes that, as long as you get paid by the white man, you got one story. And then when the white man moves you over to another position and you want to be in this position, or maybe you don't even want to win it. Maybe you just down to pull some votes. I don't know. But see, I'm tired of Negroes like Sydney. And other Negroes that we've had in this city that sing a good song, but when, when the music comes up, we find out they pantomime. 
It was just a music playing. So to make mill power, to make Memphis an economic base of power, then we've got to eliminate the Negroes that are selling us out. And I'm gonna let you answer that. I gotta take a commercial message. We'll take a commercial message and we'll be right back here on the Thaddeus Man Theory Show. Who is this that keeps calling me while I'm on the air? Sir, so, and if I had my phone on, you wouldn't be calling me on this line. What the hell? You keep dialing my number, and you see I'm talking on the air. Don't call, in fact, don't call my number no more, okay? Don't even call me when I put the other one on there. If you let damn rude, you see me talking on there and you come still ringing my, my cell phone. I don't want to talk to you. You ain't got sense enough to even understand business. You see me on the show and you call me on my personal cell phone. This ain't the number that you use when I'm on there, fool. So don't dial my damn, don't dial my damn number no more. Ain't nothing you need to tell me. Sheets 
or a package of two memory form seconds. Seconds. They're located at 2790 Kirby Wynn Road at the corner of Summer Avenue in Bartlett, next door to the Hollywood Feed. They're open Monday through Sunday from 10 to 7 and Sunday from 12 until 6. Five, four, three. And welcome back to the Thaddeus Manti Show. Let me make a correction on something I said earlier in the show when I was talking about Crumpets getting arrested. That wasn't his wife. That was Debo's from Debo's Wings that uh, his wife was caught doing that wild thing with that man, not, not Miss Crump. So my apologies for that. But uh, y'all better eat your, 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 your wings when you go to uh, Crumpets because he'll choke you. That's what the police report says right here. My, my guest tonight is Ricky Wilkins, well-known public figure in the area of the legal courts system, done quite well for himself there, very close to politics, was diagnosed at the beginning of the, this year with brain cancer after two surgeries and remission. Ricky is on a mission for black folk. I, I'm reading a news story that you said, Ricky, over at Mount Pistol. I'm going to tell the truth from now on, y'all. I ain't playing with nobody no more. I'm not going to remain silent. I'm not going to be paralyzed. I'm not going to be muted. Uh, I'm going to speak the truth in this community, whether they like it or not, so that we can move beyond this dismal place we are in. The reason I'm doing this is because I don't want nothing from black folk. I don't want nothing from white folk. I just want the city to do right by blacks. You also cited in that interview that less than 1% of business receipts in Memphis go to black owned businesses. We stated this, that whites are getting 99% of our money, 99% of our money. So, does the mind, well, yeah, we know it, the mindset got to check. The mindset, has the, to mind, the mindset of doing business with black folk has got to change. We, we have no drives. I, I see already, we march for this, uh, we march for that, and, and, and marching is not doing it for us, okay? That, that did well when y'all want to say we shall overcome and kumbaya, my lord. That, that, that did well back in those days, but now, if you want to put pressure on whites in this community when you're upset about an issue, you have to have economic boycotts. When we start spending our money with us, and I'm talking about for all the businesses that we can, you may not have a provost, but you can go and buy bread from somebody in the black community. You may not can get all of your groceries, but we've got to learn. But, but here's another thing. Black businesses are, are going to have to act as though they respect us. In, in the area where my church is, I eat a lot at Piccadilly and Raleigh now. You see eat a lot in White Haven. I went to a black business in the area, a black restaurant that I wanted to patronize. But you got a dumpster at the front door. Okay? You got, a, you got one of them great big dumpsters at the front door. I parked my car by the dumpster. The flies were eating me before I could get to the rest. The food was good, okay? When I made mention to the owner, I didn't make it loudly. I said, brother, you got the dumpster at the door. I don't want to be met by the flies. I don't want that to be your maitre d'. I, I, I want to be able to pull up, come into your, your business, have some good food, and leave. So, does the black business owner also have to prepare for blacks to come to their businesses? You know, that is, I talk a lot uh, when I'm out and about in the community talking to young and old about the concept of having an attitude of excellence. Okay. An attitude of excellence. And what it means simply is in all aspects of my life, from the time I wake up to the time I go down at nighttime, I want to be excellent. 
Mm -hmm. Excellent presentation, excellent in the way I interface with other folks, excellent in the way I dress, excellent in the way I, I carry myself. Mm -hmm. It's all about being excellent. When mm -hmm. you think of yourself that way, when you work toward that, mm -hmm. it, it, it has a way of sort of transcending your entire life. The idea that when someone is coming to my business, mm -hmm. when you come into my law firm, you know you're coming into a professional environment mm -hmm. because that's it, 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 it displays that attitude of excellence. Mm -hmm. So with all our businesses, we've got to understand that we're trying to get not just customers, but more importantly, repeat customers. Okay. Repeat customers. Mm -hmm. That's how you keep the lights on. That's how you sustain yourself over years. I've been practicing law now 27 years. And when you walk into your office, you can't tell whether it's a white you firm. Would, you wouldn't know who worked there. And you, you own that building too. <laughs> 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 okay, <laughs> but when you walk into your building, right. okay, right. you couldn't tell that it's a black law firm. You would not know it. Okay, you know because it. you have set yourself to a certain standard. Be excellent. Well, white folk come to you as well as black folk for your legal service because you've proven yourself Absolutely. as an, an attorney. So we've got to change our, our, our mindset. I jump on the black politicians a lot because when it comes to running for office, you take all your money to the white folk. Okay? You, you, you don't advertise with black owned media, but you want the black vote. Okay? Uh, when Harold Collins ran, Harold didn't want to pay me. But you want to be the mayor of black folk, I got the most watched. Show in town at night, black folk watching, white folk too. And, and, and you don't want to, but you're going to pay $7,500 for one commercial to be on Empire while we're trying to build an empire in the city. So we've got to change the mindset of not only the people, because the people ain't going to be no better than what they're taught. We have not been taught to be economically feasible. But let me go back to that is to a point that I want to make, getting back to economic power, empowerment and political empowerment. When African Americans speak mm -hmm. and speak in a unified voice, mm -hmm. politicians and would-be politicians can dance to a different drumbeat. It is the absence of that that causes them to dance to another beat. Mm -hmm. Because again, if you are running for office, and you don't have the ability to raise the kind of funds within the African American community, you're going to go where the funds are coming from. And I will promise you that there are white businessmen who size up the political landscape mm -hmm. and are willing to write checks mm -hmm. over and over again to make sure that their candidate is in office. When they know that a seat is going to be held by an African American, Mm -hmm. They are running and tripping on each other mm -hmm. to write those checks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, as some folks have also understood and found out, whether they knew it or not, the minute the white community sees an opportunity mm -hmm. to put a white person in a political seat, 99.9% mm -hmm. .9 of the time, they're going to do that over an African American. Well, the, let's, let's talk about that. The Democrats... <laughs> In Sherry County, what was the last time they they won a countywide race? Huh? Very, very rarely does it happen, or has it happened? And, and what what we've seen is that in the primary, the white Democrats, because you've got to register as a uh, as a Democrat or Republican, you got to declare. That's what I want. You got to declare whether you're a Democrat or Republican in the primary, you may get a black candidate because the white Democrats have declared Democrat. But in the general election, where it all pays off in, and there is no declaration, we've seen it time after time. I know at least the last 12 years, We've seen that white Democrats flip and vote for the Republican. Mathematically, it would be unsound 
if they ran Democrat, Republican. Right? So white folk, and I can't get mad at white folk, white folk take care of each other. Absolutely. Okay? The only black that won in the last county election, and black folk thought he was, was white, Paul Boyd. Mm -hmm. Probate clerk. Okay? Paul Boyd. Ain't no Negro named Paul Boyd. So you feel all right to vote for Paul Boyd. Though I guess white folk really got tricked too. <laughs> so <laughs> on, on, on that one. But we, we never see it happen. So when we look at the numbers of registered voters, we're in the majority. Absolutely. Blacks are the majority of registered voters in the county. But we don't go to the polls. Now, when we start talking about supporting the black candidate, is it because black folk have not seen a change in their conditions, their environment, their economics from having black leadership? So they said, well, why am I going to go? Let me address that for a second, because I, I, I get people talking to me about that issue all the time. I have to put things in context, because context is important. For 150 years or more, prior to the election of Harrington in 1991, mm -hmm. the Memphis community was founded, constructed, ran, dominated by white folks, mm -hmm. white men. Mm -hmm. They are the architects mm -hmm. of the city mm -hmm. and controlled it. And put in place structural components that solidifies that power base mm -hmm. for decades and decades and decades. In fact, we didn't get term limits until we got out to Harold. That's exactly right. And so now, people want to say, well, we had a black mayor, and not a whole lot changed. Well, first of all, that's not true. Prior to Harrington being elected mayor, very few African Americans were appointed to any major positions in city government leadership. Very few lawyers did legal work for the city of Memphis. Probably 1981. A lot of folks who are now retirees who served the city of Memphis because they got positioned and promoted uh, over the years are now receiving pension checks from the city of Memphis. People don't talk about it. But the, but the people who raise hell the most when you start talking about raising pensions are the white uh, former city uh, uh, employees who retired long ago and who make up the bulk of the folks who receive the pension benefits mm -hmm. because they were in power for all those years. People put a black face on that issue now, but that's a recent phenomenon over the span, the total span of time. Mm -hmm. So it's unfair to look at black candidate, I mean, I'm sorry, black employee here, black employee there, and say, oh, that's what's wrong with the city in terms of the city not having the money. And let me say this about the city not having the money. This city is plentiful financially. Mm -hmm. This is not a city that does not have money. It has, to the contrary, tremendous financial resources. The problem is, it just doesn't make it to the black community. I mean, we were going to go get Amazon and play all this money that we didn't think well, we had. Where was that money coming from? See, in that, time, okay. listen, I, one thing I found out in representing a lot of uh, corporations, a lot of white businessmen and women, is anything that they decide they want, they can get it. They will go and get it. They will pull the resources together to make it happen. The problem with the African American community is no one has never made that. Again, I go back to this concept about mm -hmm. forcing our politicians and those who want to represent us to make us their number one priority. Well, I, I look some people think that's idealistic. I don't. You're the majority in the community. You ought to be number one. Well, and when you you've got when you look at the city council, and I saw. City Councilman Edmund Ford Jr. on the page a little while ago. When you get a majority black city council, 
you got the power to move City Hall to Orange Mountain if you yes, wanted you. to. Absolutely. Okay. I had a problem when I when I saw all this money that was being poured into the cross town. Okay. What is Klondike gonna get out of it? What is Smoky City? Dixon Homes, New Chicago, Bauer. What are you? Why didn't I hear something at the table? Well, if you want this, then you gotta give me that. Then I gotta have this. Absolutely. I I've always heard City Council. Well, my colleague. Hell, your colleague said see you know. Okay, you lied to us and said that you will represent us. So how do you spend all those millions of dollars? Then you take a city, a white city councilman who has a conflict because he's part of the management company. Okay, oh, you, you don't want to say nothing about no conflicts there. But Berlin Board, Joe Brown, whoever else represents that area, why didn't you demand? You could have held up. Blacks on the city council could have held all the money up for that particular project until they got something for the rest of the people. You know, I won't uh, continue to make it. You know, you, we've heard uh, uh, comparisons made to Atlanta many, many times. But one thing I think the African American community in Memphis <coughs> needs to, again, understand and put in context. When Maynard was elected mayor of Atlanta, mm -hmm. he was followed after serving one or two terms, I forget the exact number, he was followed by Ian. Mm -hmm. Then Bill Campbell came along. Mm -hmm. Then Shirley came along. Mm -hmm. Then now Kasim has come along. Once African Americans in Atlanta seized political power, they then held on to that political power to create economic power for the African American community. And guess what happened along the way? White people saw value in building relationships with the African American community because the alternative was you were going to do, you going to do any business. Mm -hmm. We have to have African American leaders in this town. Why hasn't it happened? To draw that line. Why hasn't it happened? It hasn't happened because it goes back to the point I made earlier. You have to have politicians who are independent enough, who are self-sacrificing enough to put themselves at risk and at exposure with a traditional white business community that funds most, if not all, of the campaigns. You'll find very few African Americans who run for office who don't have a significant portion of their funding coming from the white business community. Yes. That's a problem. That's a problem when you are representing a large African American community that needs, again, to be the number one priority. It is hard for you to get there when the politician has to go and look at that white businessman who wrote that check to him, those checks, to him when his interests collide with your interests. So you can't say no to Freedom Street. It's hard to say no. You can't say uh, no to Terrell. It's hard to say no. Okay. Uh, and all those other guys that run. You know the reason why I ran for Congress? What? Because I wouldn't tell them no. Well. Because I didn't want nothing from them. <laughs> let, me open up, let me open up another can of worms, Rick. Yeah. Field Street. Yes. Okay. Yes. Millions of dollars. And I've called your name and talked about this, so I'm glad you're here. So you can tell them I'm telling the truth or tell them a lie. Bill Street is a public owned street. It is. Owned by the citizens of Memphis. In theory it is. In theory. <laughs> in, in theory. In theory it is. That Citizens of the city of has to pay to go on. But that was millions of dollars that was missing. Rather, Catron and I, the Bill Street Development Corporation, were before the city council some years ago because he couldn't get there. And I started talking about it on the radio. 
Dr. Harrington, on his way out, started an investigation into Beale Street. You were the attorney that Dr. Harrington put in charge of the investigation. Am I right? Correct. What did you find, Rick? Well, I will tell you that that issue involving Bill Street and its maintenance and its governance and its operations has been uh, a sticking point in the side of the city of Memphis for going on now 30 years. Mm -hmm. It continues to this day. Mm -hmm. um, there are numerous examples of where the city of Memphis has been taken advantage of by the operators on the street. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the oversight that's required to manage and keep in place appropriate checks and balances was lacking, severely mm -hmm. lacking in a, mm -hmm. lot of, a lot of respects. Mm -hmm. And as a result, and especially when in many, many areas you're dealing with cash, mm -hmm. cash, mm -hmm. there are many, many opportunities for cash to end up in places where it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. So when I went down on the street, my job was to do a thorough investigation to make sure that there was compliance with the lease and the sublease mm -hmm. to ensure that 100% of the money that belonged to Caesar went to him mm -hmm. and that everything else went to the city and or Randall Catron as founder of, uh, as head of BSDC. Mm -hmm. And we were in the process involved in a major litigation battle, uh, uncovering what I call the Gordian knot of activities. You know what a Gordian knot is? No, tell me what you're about. Gordian knot is a knot that is so intricate in its formation that you don't know the beginning from the end that you can't unravel it because of how interconnected all of the parts are. Mm -hmm. And that was done by design mm -hmm. to make it very, very difficult to get to the bottom, if you will, of the money trail. Because you create so many different avenues and so many different entities and you intertwine them in such a way that anybody that's coming to try to figure it out, mm -hmm. has a hell of a job on their hand. But we were tenacious, and we were figuring it out. And we were exposing. I want to say this to your listening audience, because this is one thing, and I don't really talk about it. Bill Street's a sore spot for me. It's the first time in my professional career I was ever attacked professionally. By mm -hmm. my own client, by the way. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Mm -hmm. I'm representing you. Mm -hmm. You turn around and you attack me. And, and let me bring this point into there. This was during the transition. Is that correct? Dr. Harrington had left office. Right. Myron, right. Myron Lauren was the interim mayor at the time. Your investigation was going on. About to conclude. About to conclude. Mm -hmm. And we knew that there was money from Bill Street that was being used all around the country. Okay, C City of Memphis funds. That's right, taxpayer dollars. Taxpayer dollars that were being used all around the country to build developments, as a development, as a development. Millions of dollars, you had located, this ain't right, then what happened? Well, um, I shall never forget it. It was September of 2009. Mm -hmm. um, I'd been in court that day. We had 15 motions on the motion docket. We had a special judge out of Nashville overseeing the case because there were a lot of conflicts. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to ensure that the judge that was seeing the case didn't have any connection with anybody in Memphis. Call a spade a spade, we'll win, lose, or draw but it won't be based on any uh, alliances or relationships that anyone might have. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And so we got a special judge to handle the case. And on the day that I got terminated, we had 15 motions. Who terminated you? I was terminated by Myron. Okay. Myron was interim mayor uh, at the time. Mm -hmm. We've been in court that afternoon, uh, literally all day. Mm -hmm. um, 14, 15 motions on the docket. We won 14 out of 15. Mm -hmm. And the 15th one, uh, the judge said, I think I'm gonna rule with you on this one as well. I just wanna sleep on it overnight. One of those motions involved the lifting of the seal to produce to the public mm -hmm. the information that we had uncovered during our investigation. Okay. Because throughout the entirety of the lawsuit, the allegation had been that the monies at issue were private dollars and therefore uh, should be protected or sealed from public consumption. Mm -hmm. But we were able to show and demonstrate in untying that Gordian knot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that there was public money and significant public money that was at issue. Mm -hmm. And so that seal was lifted. We went home that night after celebrating uh, what to a lawyer uh, to win 15, 14 out of 15 motions is pretty, pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, turn on the TV to learn that I was being fired. I laugh and tell people I'm the only lawyer in the history of the city of Memphis that got fired in a press conference. Somebody called a press conference to announce that they were firing me. But the sad part of it is this, and most people still don't know this. The first time the city of Memphis ever received a dime from Bill Street was through the efforts of my law firm. Mm -hmm. Now you don't know that because nobody wants to talk about that. I know because I, I talked to Randall. Well, Randall knows about okay. it. Randall, Randall, Randall. Randall was still alive yeah. at the time. Right, right. And knows, but we were able to wrestle that tiger to the ground. Mm -hmm. And it was kicking and bucking and scratching and doing everything they could do but the facts were the facts and the law was the law. And we were unwilling to allow them to continue to try to deny the fact that the street was making money. Because as you will recall, Miss Lucille's on your mind. Miss, Miss G, <laughs> hello, Miss Lucille, love you. Uh, they denied the fact that the mm -hmm. street was making money. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a South Memphis kid. Mm -hmm. Long before I went to Howard and Vanderbilt, mm -hmm. You was at you Carver. Can't I was at Carver <laughs> Riverview. I could have still been over there. You can't tell me that the number one tourist attraction in the state of Tennessee mm -hmm. is not, it's not making any money. I just don't believe that. Mm -hmm. Before I even get started unraveling your Gordian and not, I go in knowing mm -hmm. that you're not being honest about this. Mm -hmm. So let's get to the bottom of it. We worked on it. Another significant thing, I hired one of the best forensic auditors in the country to, to, to assist me in the case. Not from Memphis, no Memphis ties, didn't know a soul in Memphis. I did that purposefully. Mm -hmm. Because again, when you're dealing with that kind of money, strange things happen, I just put it that way. Mm -hmm. So, Still. We, strange things happen. Uh, so we hired this forensic auditor who came in and did a bang up job. Mm -hmm. When the case was concluded, when I said not concluded, when I got, when my involvement in the case was concluded, mm -hmm. my client never asked me a single question regarding the work that I had been doing on behalf of the city. Mm -hmm. Not one question. They didn't ask me for one transitional thought. They wanted me out of the way. Plain and simple. Well, let's go. And it was their job, it was their right, if you will, to remove me. Why did Myron Glory stop the investigation? Well, his, if you talk to him, he would say to you that we were spending a lot of money, quote, on legal fees and expert fees and that there should just be a settlement to resolve the case. <laughs> um, I don't know why he didn't feel as if that instruction was provided to me, 
we couldn't have pursued that as a way to bring the case to a close. Can, but can I get an answer to that? Well, you know, I, you, 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 you <laughs> might not want to say it. Can I, can, you can say can it. I, can, can I get an answer say to that? It. Because I was very much involved. Sure, you were. And I remember. Yeah. That's how I first really met you. Yeah. In that case. Yeah, yeah. I think me and Randall came, That's how came down to the office. And Randall would give me copies of all the stuff that you were giving him. But let's just call it the way it was. Mary and Laura got both. Okay? You don't want 14 or 15 motions that particular day, and all of this paperwork is going to be opened up to the general public to see that millions of taxpayers' dollars have been stolen over the years, and call it what it is, because what's the, what's the name? I can't think of his name now. Elkerton. Elkerton had control of everything on Bill Street. He took over Candace Paul. He enclosed it and used it as his own. He had all of the signage on Bill Street. Money was coming in to him. He was taking money all around the country. And when you won all of those motions, somebody said to that Negro that was only going to be mayor for 75 days, we're going to make sure that you become the next elected black mayor of the city. I don't even think they gave him no money. Okay? Because see, you can promise some Negro or something and they'll turn on you. Get him out the way. And you were it. taken out of the picture because millions of dollars have been stolen off of Bill Street and then they fire you, come up with a little settlement for him, and give, give John Elkerton a parade. Yes, they did. When AC got that, let's Let's give John Elkerton a parade. And you still don't have the money to this day. Daddy, some of the stuff you have to laugh about, I, I tell people, I say, you know, um, one of the things that I, I gained a newfound respect for uh, the power that money can have over people. I mm -hmm. said, you know, I've never been involved in a case where my adversary was able to change the narrative from how much money they were improperly using mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to how much money I was earning. Mm -hmm. How much money I was earning. You will remember that back at that time, the press started talking about how much, how, money, how much making. money I was making. Not how much money was at issue that there were major suspicions and questions about relative to the operations on the street. And so, but, 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 come on, Rick, let's understand. Anytime a black man in this town stands up, he's attacked. Absolutely. They used to be, hell, I know about the little law for okay? What do you think happened with Dr. Harrington, okay? When he no longer wanted to play ball with the white boys and start telling them to kiss his ass, <coughs> they got mad. They put everything that they could when they went and got that little skinny girl, that skinny black girl from the projects on Dr. Harrison. All of us that knew Dr. Harrison knew that ain't his kind. <laughs> okay? You, you, you lying. You, the FBI meeting out at folks' house. Richard Fields and, and, and that, whole, that whole group. So they were going to attack you. But they didn't want to talk about the white law firms, Birch, Portland, and all them folk that were making millions of dollars off the city of Memphis, but because the black man was able to make a few million, he ain't supposed to have it. Everybody got upset. I tell my white friends this, and I say, you know, you guys haven't made. First of all, you can't pay white folks too much money. I tell them that. That's the truth. You cannot pay white people too much money. I don't care how much it is. White folks not gonna say anything about it. And black folks ain't black folks ain't gonna say nothing about it. But let a black man make more than what people think is a decent amount of money to make. Mm -hmm. And different people have different thoughts about what that is. Mm -hmm. But make a dime more than that. Everybody is talking about it. Everybody. Mm -hmm. You deal with that when you are growing in a community that has not yet felt empowered 
to be an equal. I'm an equal to my white colleagues. Mm -hmm. I know it and they know it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why I get paid the way I get paid. Mm -hmm. Because again, we're talking about excellence. Mm -hmm. You excellent, you can expect to be treated like your colleagues. Politically in town, however, people don't want to see that. And that's what happens. When I'm out, I said to my white friends, I said, listen, if you go out and you earn $2 million working for the city of Memphis, nobody will even know about it. Because mm -hmm. the commercial appeal is not going to write about it. You never heard of the monies that white law firms earn from the city of Memphis. And I might add, and have been earning for the last 25, 30, 40 years. I had to do an open records request. To, to get it. Yeah. People don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. So when you see an African-American lawyer here or there, you ought to be happy that finally somebody was able to, if you will, break that mold mm -hmm. so that that door is open for people to be judged based on their talent and rewarded as such. I refuse to let anybody pay me less than what I know my talent provided for. Mm -hmm. Why would I do that? Mm -hmm. And so if you can't get, if you've got an issue with that, that's your problem, not mine. I know what my worth is, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to let you pay me less than what my worth is. But my results speak for that and justify what I'm paying. It's just that in a, in a community like Memphis, where there is not this attitude of sharing, we don't have an attitude of sharing in Memphis. That's why that less than 1% number, embarrassing number, is what it is. So what do we do? What, what, what do we do? Well, I mean, Here's my first step. Okay. My first step is I'm not mad at white people. Okay. I'm not mad at you. You may hear me talk about you, but only in the context mm -hmm. of helping my people understand just how messed up this financial. Thing. And you can't get mad at the white man to do for his fault. Not mad at you. I'm mad at black folks mm -hmm. because we have the power in our own spending, with our own political clout, if we use it to dramatically improve our condition. God has put the power in our hands. Mm -hmm. In our hands. Mm -hmm. And yet we refuse to use it. We got to stop doing business with people who don't do business with us. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. Start spending your money with people who spend their money with you. Plain and simple. Next time you're getting ready to go out and buy something new, ask yourself this question. Mm -hmm. Has this business supported me in my business? Mm -hmm. Has this business hired my son? Has this business helped promote my daughter? You know, Burnell and I were having a conversation a couple of days before his passing. Mm -hmm. Good brother, gone way too soon. He called me and he was on, he, he had texted me, he said, Man, we ain't talked in a while. I need to get together with you on a project. I said, okay. So I called him. And we were talking, he had this project with the new Tri-State Defender about a discount card for black businesses. I told, I told Burnell, I said, Burnell, I, I don't know if I can work with this project with you. We can do something else on economic empowerment. I said, but I can't get black folks to advertise with me. Okay. They say, you know, they try to figure out how's he doing, what he do, how's he on TV, how he got all that church out there, how he drive, what he drive, what he doing. I work. Okay? So I run into that same thing. I don't want to help pay for them clothes. I don't want to help pay for that Mercedes he drive. I don't want to pay for that house he lives in. Okay? Which I had all that for the church start. Then I went and got church and went and got a brand new van for the church. You don't want to see me grow because you don't think you're supposed to have no money. Okay? It's all right. It's all right to take your advertising dollars to the white man. Okay? To the white man, you'll take your, you'll take your advertising dollars there and they'll charge you three times what I charge you per month. Won't even give you what the amount of commercials that I'm going to give you and you won't do business with me. So I told Bernal, I told Bernal, I said, man, I can't work with you on that. Because I ain't want none of those people 
do business with me. And I'm to the point now, Ricky, that if you can't do something for me, why am I going to do something for you? Why am I going to enhance your pockets and you don't want to just put a few little tokens in there? So we, we were coming, we, in fact, we were supposed to meet that Monday after his passing to put together a joint effort where you could buy advertising here and on at the paper at the same time. That will most likely uh, not happen. But you, you get this courage, man, in dealing with our folk when our folk don't realize the economic base we have. You don't understand the economic power that we have. Conversations that I have on the air. Anybody else want to have those conversations? Agree, agree. Okay. The, the, the black guys that you see working for white stations, they work for the white stations. Okay? They got to say what's on the teleprompter. Or what's on the script in front of them. You better not start talking about this. What we're talking about. You better not talk, start talking about Bill Street. Because when they went against you, it was a systematic plot to discredit you. Because as we looked at that other list, they control the media in this town. Okay? They control the media. So he who controls the communications controls everything. Let's take a commercial break and we'll be back here on the Thaddeus Matthew Show. jobs 
He's over here. He's this is over here. Okay, I got you. Okay. Just continue that. Welcome back to the Thaddeus Matthew Show, about the last 20 minutes of the show. My guest tonight, with very interesting conversation, attorney Ricky Wilkins. And we we'll been talking about politics and uh, economics in the black community. And we need to start spending black dollars. And I urge those of you who have black businesses, you want to enter the holiday season, you're getting ready to go into the Christmas season, why aren't you advertising on this particular show? If you want to advertise, 949-3000 happens to be uh, the number. Er the area code 901-949-3000 happens to be uh, the number if you want to advertise. If you really believe in black business and even those of you who were a part of a discount program that the tri-state defender is still going to do i'm sure advertise on 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 the show get your visual commercial get your read uh commercial on this particular show if we lose the communications of the black community then we have no communications at, at all Okay, we have none at all. When you hear Ricky Wilkins talking about blacks doing business with blacks, it's time. It's it's time for those type of decisions to be made. Ricky, when we look at where we've come, you know, we've been to the mountaintop and we've been seeing the promised land, and, but what did the civil rights prepare us for as for as economic empowerment? Well, I, I would tell you that one of the things that as a 
somewhat student of history who has looked at the historical struggle of African-American community, people talk about Dr. King and his I Have a Dream speech. Mm -hmm. And for most of them, that's pretty much all they want us to remember him for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I like to remind people not about what Dr. King said relative to I Have a Dream and his four little children being judged by the content of their character, but the words that he spoke right before he was assassinated. Mm -hmm. Because he had moved beyond the question mm -hmm. of whether or not we're going to be able to sit the same lunch counter to somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I tell people that when Dr. King went to North Carolina to desegregate lunch counters, they spit on him. Mm -hmm. When he went to Mississippi to protest police brutality, police brutality, they called him all kinds of names. When he went to Chicago and he tried to desegregate white neighborhoods, they bricked him. When he went to Birmingham, mm -hmm. they started talking about the injustices in the transportation system. Mm -hmm. They bombed him. Mm -hmm. But when he came to Memphis, when he started talking about economics, economics for a poor people, that's when they killed him. Because economics was the next step in his progression. Mm -hmm. As he con communicated with our people about how to get, if you will, to that proverbial promise link. Mm -hmm. 50 years later, we're still trying to get there. Economics is a thing that we have to focus on. And it starts for us first by spending the money that's in our hand, I mm -hmm. mean the money that mm -hmm. we earn, mm -hmm. and who we spend it with. And then number two, we've got to create that political that power base so that we can then control the levers of government and use that, those levers to put money in our communities in a way that is commensurate with the numbers that we have politically and demographically. That has not happened. It must happen if we're going to move this. So will you be taking your movement of manpower around Shelby County? Will you be setting up meetings to speak with blacks and having, I don't know what you would call it, an economic political conference or, or summit, uh, is, is, is that as, as we get ready to go into this political year. That's exactly what we're doing. Okay. What will Mill Power be doing? Well, we've got a series of things that are going. We've got these public forums that you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, that we will continue to do mm -hmm. in various parts of the community. Mm -hmm. We're working with a lot of pastors because mm -hmm. we know the African American church is so critical and foundational in, 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 in our uh, in, in the fabric of our community. The African mm -hmm. American church's role uh, is so critical and significant. So we've been meeting, reaching out and talking to a number of uh, religious leaders across ecumenical lines. I'm okay. 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 One of the first things that I did that is is I reached out to the Nation of Islam. Okay. To talk to them about joining us. Well, because okay. historically. Mm -hmm. People see rifts among African American people based on religion. Mm -hmm. AMEs can't get with AMEs. Mm -hmm. AMEs can't get with you know can't get with Baptists, and you got all these rifts. And I say to people, if you're on the Titanic, it doesn't matter if you're on the top level and you got the best view, or you're in the belly of the ship. No, so you can't see that. Everybody goes down. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is the issue for the African-American community. We have got to stand together on one accord, regardless of where we are in the pecking order, so to speak, mm -hmm. on this issue of economics. Well, you know, when you, when you mention the nation of Islam, and I, and I brought this factor up, first of all, I have publicly said that I am a follower and a supporter of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrell. Absolutely. Um, I count Minister... Anthony Muhammad, Brother Anthony Good Muhammad, Good. as men who have a vision, who have a plan. Absolutely. And I was explaining to our... And they're not afraid. No, no, they ain't fearful. 
I was explaining to our audience because a lot of times they don't understand what they see when they see the brothers on the corners with the paper, right. with the bananas or bean pies, wherever it is, that these brothers are businessmen. Mm -hmm. That these brothers are, they have gotten the papers, gotten the merchandise from the nation at a different price. They come on the corner, this is their own business. It's not for just the support of a ministry. If these are how some of these brothers feed themselves. Many of those brothers are, are felons. So they have created their own business to be able to economically empower themselves. Now, be what, a if, what if all of the 4,000 black churches we got in Memphis and Shepherd County would create a very similar program of empowerment and liberation? That's the reason I named Naked Truth, Naked Truth Liberation and Empowerment. Quit begging. Okay, what are we going to do to create our own economic base? It's going to start with us. It's got to start in our communities. We've got to be empowered. Our mindset has got to change. And then we just got to get mad. Absolutely. Okay, we get, we get mad when the white folk kill somebody in the black community, which is very rare, because we're killing us. But why don't we get mad enough to create an economic base that we can stop begging? Quit depending on the government to give you something. Because as long as they give you a handout, they control you. As long as they put you in a section eight, you have no mindset of going to get your own house. So we've got to come together. We've got to do something. I stand with you. Anytime you want to bring the meeting to Raleigh, you got a place. Ain't, ain't no whip hands and whips. I ain't got no board. I got to ask you no back. You just say, look, I I'm liberated. You liberated. I'm liberated. You liberated. Okay. Definitely. I ain't got no deacons I got to worry about. I ain't got nobody. Uh, you say you want to have a meeting to empower our people, then that's what we're going to do. We, we got to change the economic mindset of our people. Everybody comes into our community, they get rich. And they go back to the suburbs. That's exactly right. I don't care. All these national, they are taught in their countries. Man, if you go to Memphis, mm -hmm. they ain't nothing but consumers. Nothing but consumers. And going there, they're going to buy anything. Anything you get, they'll buy. We don't try to create our businesses. And then when we have a business, we don't want to advertise our business. We don't want to empower our business. And I've told, and I'm going to represent it again. Can the politician come with a short to you advertise? You ain't going to take your money to the white man and then come use my black audience. That, uh, mm -mm. And, any, and any black politician that does not want to support black media, be it me, be it the new tri-state defender, be it WLOK, the only black on radio station you got in the market, then I'm coming against you. Because you can't really want to the support of black folk, and you don't support the black voices that you got in the community. No doubt. We have to support each other. I mean, uh, to me, it, it is we're shooting ourselves in the foot when we fail to do so. And the problem is we've done it for so long that it's become ingrained in our psyche, mm -hmm. and we've got to change that. And it starts with getting our young people to understand one of the things we're doing in Empower, we've got a youth uh, group uh, that's, that's involved. I went and talked to some of the young folks at Lamont College. Mm -hmm. That's some of them involved because we've got to start training young folks at a very age. What is that? Mm -hmm. When you tell them the clothes that go well there, the hell they want to go to the clothes. That ain't going to be done by some homes right here. Will you tell him to find the damn code? That's, that's a good point. We'll get him out to sign the law. He's signing the law. Is that what you're signing? He's signing the law. Don't nobody know the code? Don't I guess we all sound the alarm 
Until tomorrow, top of the evening to you.